Good morning and welcome to day five of the Scope live stream. Our first live presenter today is Dr. Roberto Sussman. I'm going to bring him in. Hello, hola. Hola, hola. ¿Cómo estás? <laughs> bien, bien. ¿Tú? Muy bien, muy bien. Voy a apagar. I'm going to turn off this light. Gracias. Thank you. No, yeah, because no, it's crazy. No, no. It's like reflection. Yeah. <laughs> Don't mind us. This is how we are. Um, okay, just finishing one last detail. Yeah. And I'll be ready in uh, one minute. Just All right, not a problem. Oh. No, it's okay. It's okay. No. I can't hear you. What's going on? Where's your um, headset, your microphone? Uh, there you are. Am I muted? No, or you can hear no. me. I can hear you now. Yeah, before you were very like muted. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. It's just a, a Yeah, I, I, I yes, one final transition. Yeah. No, I probably okay. won't. Take your time. I think that's. Uh, yeah, it's it's okay. I'm 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 ready. Uh, I'm ready. All right, to... share your screen, and we'll go and do this like we did it every the past two days. Yes, how much time I have? You've got 90 minutes. Don't worry. I've got you. I gave you okay, extra time. Okay. So, yeah, there's a lot of material I'm going to cover, but you can always yeah. ask me questions, okay? So yeah, we can go to two, we can go to 2 hours if we need to, okay? It's just that's the max okay. line is 2 hours, all right? We drop that. <laughs> yeah, we we'll just vaporize, yeah. Turn into pumpkins we'll, or something. We'll be vaporize. Vaporize. <laughs> for life. <laughs> okay, I'm sharing a window. Yes. And this this one. Okay, share. All right, I'm going to add it in. Uh, tell me if you can see it. All right, team, can we see this? There we go. Yeah, they should be able to see that. Hold on. Everybody's <clears throat> saying good morning to you. Liana, Janine, Patrick. And um, so it's visible for everybody. It is visible. I am going to go off screen. I will be microphone. And if any questions come up, I will ask you. Okay. So, okay. Proceed. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, thank you, Nancy, for introduction. And um, this is the third, is the third of the sequence of my talks. And um, I'm going to I'm going to talk about an issue that is extremely important, and in my opinion, is not getting sufficient attention from our community. It's also not getting sufficient attention from a very um, lucid people that I respect, uh, who are in public health but are supporting are supporting tobacco harm reduction, but they put. Uh, everything is smoking cessation or preventing kids or uh, the juvenile vaping and uh, all these battles and so on. But um, not so much the environmental vapor, how it can be dealt with, regulated, etc. Uh, or scientific facts about that or misinformation. They're not very interested. In fact, and, and I think that part of it and is because they are not users, they are not consumers, right? So uh, I hope that this talk would motivate people like that, people that I'm describing, and, and I do like them, I, I, I respect them very much, and I hope this would motivate a lot of people to pay more attention to this issue. Okay, so let's go. Um, I'm going to discuss issues like uh, the background, the historical background, like uh, how secondhand smoke uh, passed from being a health concern to a tool of oppression, and that uh, we should uh, prevent this happening to vaping. Um, second, I'm going to talk about science. What, what does science says? How do you compare environmental emissions from our they from vaping or tobacco heated tobacco products 
with the, with the environmental tobacco smoke and other aerosols. And also I'm going to talk about the approach like the uh, ultra protectionism versus pragmatism. And this would somehow lead to a sensible regulation in my opinion. I'm also going to discuss examples of junk science and risk miscommunication on this issue. Okay, so first background. Okay, uh, indoor smoking in the US, Canada, UK and the European Union, you know, the rich countries began from late 1980s to the 1990s. And uh, in my, uh, in the area of the world where I live in Mexico, Latin America, we are lagging behind. Like it came some years later, but it came. Um, I resented it. I, I want to be frank because I was a smoker and I was used to smoke, you know, practically everywhere. But uh, after some thinking, I understood that it was justified because environmental tobacco smoke or secondhand smoke, it's a serious pollutant for many non-smokers. And I understood that uh, these people were right. Uh, it's an imposition for them to have to breathe uh, environmental tobacco smoke. Okay, at the beginning, I'm talking about the 1990s, many places had smoking sections. And so at that time, I thought this would be a final and fair arrangement. We the smokers, we smoke, we know the risks, we know them, but do not disturb nor sicken the non-smokers. Non-smokers have their space where they are not going to be disturbed. However, gradually, all these uh, smoking sections disappeared and the bands started covering all indoor spaces, all of them, bars, restaurants, everywhere, indoors, right, at that time. So uh, I ask uh, medic medical uh, doctors that are my friends or and health authorities also, I ask them why the smoking sections are going away. The replies were, well, you know, you have to worry about the health of the waiters. Like you, you don't care, but the waiter, why, why should the waiter be sick? And then uh, they also say something like uh, smoke somehow creeps out of walls. And uh, these were very unconvincing answers because regarding the waiters, there are many people that accept voluntarily jobs that involve risks, like people cleaning the windows in, in high, sky uh, buildings or people delivering pizza in motorcycles in a heavy traffic city like you know mexico city they, they, it's very risky they can they are really risking them. and so these people when they are hired they sign that they are aware of the risks so why not waiters can sign that or why not you don't hire only smoking waiters and then uh, and regarding the smoke Creep, creeping out of walls. You know, I, I'm, I'm a physicist and I know that smoke in the end, you're talking about particles, molecules. You're not talking about some magic substance, some miasma that somehow can creep out. Uh, so I did not believe them. And I, and, I, and I insisted, I insisted, I kept arguing. I'm a, I'm a, a bit of a... Of a of a pain in the neck when I when I when I start arguing, and so in the end, what was the react? What was the answer? It is for the sake of the children. That's it. So at that point, you know, it's an emotional thing. It's an emotional blow, and I must confess that the first time I heard that, I stopped arguing. Okay, so I never thought that smoking would be banned in open outdoors. I never thought that, okay, I, I lost uh, as a smoker. I'm speaking as a smoker and I really enjoyed smoking. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed it, okay? And so what happened in the early 2000s? Um, in a whole windy open beach, it, 
smoking was forbidden. Not in Mexico, but in many California, Australia, in other places. Then the whole campus areas of uh, the US and Canada, which uh, I visit a lot because I have professional relationship uh, with people in, in the US and in Canada and also in the UK. And this also happened in the UK. Uh, suddenly smoking was banned in the whole campus, even in parking lots. And, the, and then it was also banned in uh, whole wood, uh, wood, wood areas, you know, woodlands. Smoking was forbidden in, in big parks. And, and that was really, really uh, annoying for me. And uh, then, you know, the notorious bans by Major Bloomberg, which we have the pleasure to interact with uh, these days. And um, yeah, he introduced uh, a very extensive outdoor bans in New York City. And uh, as you can see here in the, uh, in the red rectangle, they say smoke, secondhand smoke causes close to 50,000 deaths per year. And side effects may include lung cancer, respiratory infections, asthma, According to the American Lung Association, cigarette butts account for 75% of the litter on the New York City beaches, etc. Well, I would believe that secondhand smoke is very bad um, after long time exposure because, you know, a primary smoke takes like between 20 and 40 years to sicken and kill people. But secondhand smoke is much less diluted. So it should also take a long time to sicken people after continuous exposure. But uh, I did not believe that this, um, I that this justification, that this was the right justification for banning smoking outdoors. We're talking outdoors, not indoors. So um, by the late 2000s, in early 2010, it became a general tendency in the US and in English speaking countries. It is really English speaking countries that are leading, uh, uh, that were leading this, uh, but it, it's, it, it spread. And at some time, like uh, 100 and in 2011, smoking was banned in 105 beaches in, uh, in 507 parks, and uh, as you can see in the other, here in the map, uh, in all public places of New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Dallas, Phoenix, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Jose, smoking was banned in all parks. So it was happening, what I, what I thought would never happen, suddenly it happened. And you see there is a gradual thing, it's a gradual thing is this idea that if you throw a frog into boiling water, the frog will jump. But if you just raise the temperature a little bit, the frog will say, hey, what's happening? And, and then you say, don't worry, frog, it's only a little bit. But then these little bits and little bits and little mm -hmm. bits, in the end, the frog will be uh, boiled. You know, it's, uh, it's this approach is killing softly, is uh, doing something softly without saying, without saying where will be the end of it. Yeah. And uh, okay, so as a physicist with good training in fluid mechanics and chemistry, my bullshit detector started buzzing. Something must be wrong. Okay, in open outdoor conditions, I know that smoke dilutes very fast, and is practically undetectable at short distance from the smoker. So what health, health purposes could such bands pursue? And I got interested. I got interested in this issue. And I started following the news. And then suddenly when the major, uh, Alcalde, I don't know if I translate this correctly, the major of a small community in California, was pressed to explain the public health benefit of a ban. Uh, uh, the smoking was banned everywhere in that city. You could only smoke in your own house. And if 
your own house was not part of a flat of a, of an apartment of a common area if it was just a plain house and then she babbled helplessly to try to explain but in the end she retorted it is for the sake of the children okay so there is is there not a clear pattern of explanation like when when these people run out of explanations there are logic they are based on science they give you this emotional blow of the children and it's a pattern it's a pattern in in this in this in this step of things now i thought that i was safe in mexico from this california madness i thought this is this is something in california australia new york but i live in mexico city it's, it's different it's never going to happen but then i saw it happening the first full campus wide ban in a major private university in 2014 tecnologico de monterrey it's a very prestigious private school and uh, it smoking was banned everywhere in the campus the difference between mexico and california is that in mexico people uh, still smoked they they were they smoked secretly they disobeyed or i don't know to what degree people in california also disobeyed but nevertheless you see the tendency mm -hmm. and the straw that broke the camel's back for me was a smoking ban in a large open and windy terrace of a local starbucks in 2015. i i love to go to that terrace and uh, smoke my cigars or my pipes at the same time drinking coffee and typing in my in my laptop i enjoyed that and suddenly uh, i couldn't enjoy that and that really angered me and so at that point i started publicly confronting medical doctors and public health officials with very basic scientific arguments i'm a scientist and, and i'm trained as a scientist and i've trained people to be scientists and i've taught to thousands of students in many courses throughout my career so the reply was well dr susman you're a physicist you understand galaxies but you cannot understand the immense harm that even a small exposure to tobacco smoke can cause this is a medical issue you don't understand and i say okay okay i want to learn please show me where are the studies where is the evidence where are the studies that sustain such harm and uh, when i exhausted the arguments the same pattern happens they came back because i argued with them and they tried to defend their position and they tried to explain the harms and so on but i said well what are the doses what are the quantities show me the medical and they they would show me papers about secondhand smoke but secondhand smoke in uh, for example indian papers secondhand smoke inside uh, uh, the dwellings of the people and i said no 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 we're talking about outdoors you are showing me evidence of children getting sick indoors you're not showing me outdoors okay so i pressed them i pressed them and in the end it was always the children they would add for example, pregnant women, they, they, they say, think about a pregnant woman, your wife, for example, think about children, you have a, you have a son, right? Think about him and think about et cetera, et cetera. This emotional blow, always the same pattern. Then I learned that there were actually studies justifying outdoor bans by credentialized uh, people from medicine, like a professor of medicine in San Francisco and the Helena Montana Miracle. Uh, this was published in, in a prestigious journal. Authors were Richard Sargent, Robert Shepard, and Stanton Glantz. And there was a press release from the University of California, San Francisco, a prestigious university. See, we're not talking about universities somewhere in a backyard. We're talking about prestigious universities and uh, this 
received very positive editorials in the New York Times and also in, in Financial Times and even the BBC. I trust the BBC, it's, uh, for me, was a very reliable source and they were endorsing this. And uh, well, uh, my BS detector was buzzing and beeping mad. Bzz, 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 bzz. You know, I, I thought this is not possible. There has to be something wrong. If outdoor bands produce a decrease of admissions of myocardial infarctions, because this is what, what Glantz and the other authors were claiming, that in Elena Montana, an outdoor band was introduced and suddenly the uh, admissions to myocardial infarctions dropped by 60%. I think that they later modified it to 40%. And uh, well, I knew that it was bullshit. I really knew that because the sample was very small and it smacked to a deliberately chose fluctuation. But so I understood it was published, what, what, but, my, but my concern was why it was published. What happens with the referees? What happens with the editors? I understand that some three credentialized people, a, well, Glance, a senior professor, and these two other medics, perhaps they, you know, they smoked some, something bad and they published some junk. But why was this published? Why was not, it's not them. Is this issue whether you have a rotten apple in a, or the whole lot of apples are rotten? Because why the editors, the referees did not notice that this is bullshit? That was, that was my concern, right? Then, although there were several copycat studies of this type much later, like uh, one in Brazil, another in Denmark, and it was finally debunked for good uh, by, a, by, uh, by a national study in the U.S. using correct statistics. I'm not, an, I'm not illiterate in statistics, but it was never retracted. It was never retracted, right? Even though it was debunked, it was never retracted. And so, as I became more knowledgeable on the physics and chemistry of tobacco smoke, because I started studying it. At that time, I was also beginning to vape, but I was a dual user at that time. And uh, I found a more credible source. For example, this paper, Notice that it is not a published public health journal. It's a journal where physicists and chemists write. And uh, it was real-time measurement of outdoor tobacco smoke particles. And the people who did it were from Stanford. And there were people that had good relationships with the, with the tobacco control. I mean, they, they, were, they were on the side of the tobacco control community, right? They were not some smokers or some uh, libertarians that were challenging. No, no, they were part of the mainstream. And uh, the authors, desperate, if you read the paper, it's a very interesting paper. Um, they desperately tried to find how outdoor tobacco smoke measurements would justify open outdoor bans. You know, they put, they, they suddenly put, uh, lots of smokers together in terraces and ask them to smoke and they and they put their instruments in ways that would catch up smoke but in the end they were forced to conclude that uh, outdoor tobacco smoke levels also approach zero at distances greater than approximately two meters from a single cigarette and uh, notice that children were not involved were not invoked because it was not a public health journal, right? Like, uh, I would never imagine, maybe you can make a comment, but uh, the children are not arguments in this case. Well, it's a different setup. And, uh, and that's true. So if, if two, th two meters away from a cigarette, you detect nothing, that means that in a, in a huge park, or in a very windy beach, um, 
and then I, I'll go back to the cigarette butts also as well, because that's a problem when you but when if you provide uh, ashtrays or places, then there would be much less. But if there is no ashtray, because when smoking is banned, all ashtrays are removed, right? And I'm not defending smoking. I know that smoking is very bad. I'm, I'm here, I'm talking about a scientist, right? And about the way science is being used to pursue certain agendas. And uh, this is a very good example. Now, even among leading public health researchers, there was skepticism, skepticism and even opposition. And to Simon Chaps, Chapman's credit, I know that Simon Chapman doesn't like vaping. And it's a, it's a very, very uh, controversial character. And uh, I know that he can be very arrogant and so on. But here he was right. I think here he opposed a smoking ban in Australia. Uh, should smoking in outside public spaces be banned? And he said, no. He said, this infringes personal freedom. I don't know if Chapman has other bad opinions and so on, but in, in this issue, he acted correctly and honestly, right? In my opinion. Now, at the time, I finally found uh, what I knew was the answer of what, why this BS is published and paraphrasing Clinton, It's the normalization, stupid. It's not science. It's not health. It's something completely different. And uh, I read this very interesting article by uh, Colgrove, Bayer, and Bashinsky. And, uh, you know, I, I finally, it, it, I understood it's a policy. You know, I already knew, but this paragraph is worth reading in its entirety the argument put the arguments put forth at public hearings in new york city a ban last fall exemplified these mixtures of rationals because you know the discussion between people supporting the smoking bans outdoor bans and people being worried about that uh, not opposing them but being worried you know a health commissioner fairly cited data showing that 50% of New Yorkers had tested positive for cotinin, a marker of exposure to tobacco smoke, even though only 60% of city residents smoke. He also argued that cigarette related litter accounted for three quarters of all litter in beaches and a third of the litter in parks. This claim was based on counting individual items of litter rather than overall volume. This was met with skeptical questioning by city council members, right? And the other argument can also be counter-argued, like if 60% of the population smoke, then uh, you will have random encounters close to people smoking. And also you have to uh, uh, cotton in uh, is found at different levels. There is a, a minimal level of cotton in where you can say that uh, there is no, because cotton in will probably will never be absolutely zero. There are minimal levels. You cannot just say presence of cotton in. So finally, Fairley emphasized the importance uh, of protecting children from exposure to adult smokers who would serve as negative role models. Families, he said, should be able to bring their children to parks and beaches knowing that they won't see others smoking. You know, this is the argument of a, of a homophobe regarding homosexuals. He said, okay, okay, I don't want to exterminate them, but I, I don't want to see them. And I don't want decent people to see them. Or is the argument of uh, of uh, Islamophobes with the, you know, Muslim people who use special garments, or again, or anti-Semites against Jews who wear skull caps, or special garments also? So I don't want to see them. 
I'm a decent Christian. I want to see these guys. Okay, let them be in their own houses and let them do their rituals and so on. Let homosexuals kiss each other in their houses. I don't want to see them. This is oppression. Yeah. But this oppression is, uh, is not health anymore. Health has already been, it's nothing to do with health. It is oppression. It is oppression similar to other forms of oppression, right? And we have to call it by its name. Then said the Frank statement revealed the extent to which denormalizing smoking, as it could be denormalizing homosexuality, Muslim religion, whatever, has become a central prong of anti-tobacco efforts, both as a way of discouraging initiation of smoking and as means of pressuring current smokers to quit, transforming smoking from a desirable behavior that will be imitated to a stigmatized one that will be shunned has motivated such efforts as to push to give movies depicting smoking an R rating and cigarette counter adver advertising campaigns that depict smoking as a dirty and disgusting habit. And, and it's true, like for example, uh, uh, Disney films, smoking is forbidden, no smoking. I think that sometimes uh, scoundrels and really bad people shown in films, they can smoke. And uh, no, absolutely uh, smoking for uh, audiences that are uh, adult, uh, teenagers or children, no smoking there. And Netflix also does that. And many Hollywood studios do that. There is no smoking in films or in, in very few films. In the film 1941 about Pearl Harbor, Nobody smoke in that film. You can see it. There is not a single person smoking there. When more than 50% of U.S. Army personnel smoked during Second World War, right? So this is very similar to what Stalin did when, you know, when there were Soviet purges, the picture of Trotsky was erased. And the picture of other people that were purged in the Soviet system, they were erased. And history, uh, uh, in historical documents, even newspapers, they, all these characters were erased. So we're, we're talking about a totalitarian policy. We're talking about something that is, it is changing behavior. Changing behavior in an institutionalized way. And this is something that we should be worried about, right? You know what Which it reminds me of? People. I, I'm about to finish this section. Okay. Let me just finish this. So what is happening? Okay, this is smoking. Okay. We don't we are trying to convince people to quit smoking, right? So and this was with smoking. But we have but this is important for us because it's a background. What is happening with vaping today in the U.S. is, in my opinion, the continuation of this process. It's a continuation of this process, and it is led by mostly the same orthodox tobacco control people for whom vaping is smoking version 2.0. See, you had Windows version 1.0. And it's already exhausted, it's already old, so on. Suddenly, uh, Microsoft releases Windows 2.0. It's a different product, but, but we know it's bad. So these people are like, like pit bulls or like, uh, some, like, you know, people ready for combat with lots of adrenaline. And now smoking has been more or less knocked out. But... Where? Be, beware. Now there's another smoking version 2.0. They call it vaping. And so let's drive all the adrenaline against that. It's a continuation, right? And then perhaps we can say that there was some utilitarian justification for all this. You know, smoking is so terrible that you can say the ends justify the means. But can this be also justified with vaping and tobacco harm reduction? Shouldn't we pause? 
about that. And then perhaps we can excuse some lucid public health people who today support tobacco harm reduction for having looked the other way at that time. Why they didn't protest at that time. People that we know, love and respect who support tobacco harm reduction, they were already active then. So why didn't they protest, right? Why, why they never, they never allowed the, the, okay, we forgive them, but we should never allow this orthodoxy to get away with this type of thing on vaping and tobacco harm reduction. This process must be stopped. No pasarán, you know, and that's a very, I think this is very important. We should be aware that what is happening with vaping today in the U.S. didn't start uh, when vape, with vaping. It is a continuation of a process, and it's a process that has very worrying sides and is now affecting vaping. This is, I wanted to convey this image, so this idea. So please ask questions or comments. I welcome questions and comments before okay. the other segment. Okay, here's the thing. I mean, I'm listening to you and, and, and everybody else is listening and they're making comments and stuff. And, and what comes to mind for me, okay, I keep thinking Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. This is social engineering more than it's about any kind of health or medical issue. Yes, yes. Um, and, you know, we're sitting here and we're trying to fight these people as advocates, you know, based on the evidence and based on the facts from a very health, pers from, a, from a health perspective, when really listening to you, it's more about, like I said, the social engineering and the behavior. So, you know, I'm not sure how we convert our advocacies to include the fact that it's more about that as opposed to health. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yes. Look, we cannot change what happened. And uh, what was done was done, you know, and... Uh, in the rich in rich countries this was a policy right and in fact the who is uh, is also leading this policy at a global level and it happened to smoking and uh, okay we can say they succeeded less people smoke but uh, but we should not allow them to do this with tobacco harm reduction because tobacco harm reduction is not only product substitution Tobacco harm reduction is not only converting smokers to vapors. It, it is also an ethical, there are ethical issues there. There is the uh, uh, autonomy of the people and it is the duty of public health to provide right information. And uh, yeah, it is important to know what happened with smoking and we cannot change the past. And, and, and let me tell you something, this type of program does not work in middle income or lower income countries because to work this type of social engineering, you need either strong institutions and law abiding societies or a, or a dictatorship. It might work in North Korea because in North Korea, if suddenly the leaders of North Korea would say, smoking is terrible, smoking is imperialist, smoking is the enemy, then you can be sent to a uh, to a gulag if you smoke, or you can be shot, or and 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 people can be terrorized. So you either have a North Korean very brute or a very brutal dictatorship, like the Cambodian the, uh, people that committed this genocide, or you have law-abiding societies. But most of the of the middle income and lower income countries are are not are not there like if yeah. you try to do this in mexico and they are trying to do it now in mexico they have failed to do that in mexico there's a lot of what i mean is uh, very widespread smoking bans people in mexico would not respect that in argentina brazil even in italy and spain and so on so it doesn't work I think that this policy, if we see it from a utilitarian point of view, does it work or not? I don't care about ethics. I want results. The results are bad. It yeah, works yeah. 
only in countries with brutal dictatorships or with law-abiding societies. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And what we see is one billion smokers, 80% of them concentrated in the countries where this type of policy doesn't work. But THR might work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any no other questions from anybody? They're all just sitting there going, wow. So carry on. Okay, let's go to the other segment. The science. Okay, so I've already spoken about the chemistry of vaping and, uh, and the physical chemistry of smoking, vaping. So I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, I know suspended particles are the particular phase of an aerosol and they, an aerosol is suspended particles in a gaseous medium. Tobacco smoke and e-cigarette vapor are both aerosols, but they are very different. Tobacco smoke has a very complex chemistry. There are chemical reactions and phase changes. Chemical composition is changing by many processes. On the other hand, electronic cigarette aerosol has a very simple chemistry. There are only phase changes thermal decomposition that produces trace residues. And basically, the chemical composition remains roughly the same in all the processes of vaping, right? I am not going to repeat that, but, oh, there is a glitch here, sorry. Okay, let's see. Envi environmental tobacco smoke is, uh, comes from side stream smoke and also from the mainstream. The smoker only retains the mainstream emission, right? And uh, the side stream emission is not really, it's very little of it goes to the smoker. So it's released directly to the aerosol and it has like 80% of the second hand, like second hand smoke is 80% the side stream emission, right? Yeah. Now, what is released? 80% of the nicotine is released to the environment. Liquid and solid particles of high chemical complexity and toxicity from both emissions. But you know, the much more from the side stream emissions. Volatile gases are also released. Uh, carbon, monoxide, carbon monoxide, CO from the mainstream, and, uh, from mainstream and also, you know, the, the mass is large. It's a lot of mass. It's like uh, between 100 and 150 milligrams per cigarette, right? Um, and a cigarette involves like 10 pops. And it's a continuous emission. It is con as long as somebody is smoking, it is continuously being emitted. So we compare this with, with this. Environmental e-cigarette aerosol or secondhand aerosol it's only the mainstream vapor. There is no side stream emission. And so the emission is intermittent. It's, it, you emit and then there is nothing. You emit and then there is nothing. On the other hand, secondhand smoke, it's continuous. It's like a volcano that is continuously uh, sending fumes to the, uh, uh, to the atmosphere versus a volcano that uh, it's a small geyser and then nothing. Yeah. And then a small geyser and nothing. This is more or less a comparison. Now, what is released? 10% of the inhaled aerosol is released. 5% of the inhaled nicotine, like 5 nanograms per puff. 3% of the aldehydes. You remember I, I talk about the aldehydes, which are the scoundrels. You know, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and acrolein. Well, 97% of these guys stay in the in the vapor. Only 3%. So maybe five nanograms per puff. We're talking about tiny quantities. And less than five percent of metals, because the metals are typically will be in small particles, so they will be uh, absorbed they will be retained. The retainment of small particles is very high. And the uh, secondhand aerosol mass is much less. It's between, but it's difficult to compare it because 
when we talk about uh, about um, uh, when we talk about vaping because it's intermittent we can use puffs as units but in the case of secondhand smoke it's not intermittent it's continuous so how we compare it well let's make this comparison secondhand aerosol the equivalent cigar the cigarette equivalent mass would be 10 puffs so we have like uh, two orders of magnitude less mass we have between 1.5 and 50 milligrams in 10 puffs and uh, so it's a, it is one order of magnitude less mass so already in terms of mass the terms of the amount of of pollution that that uh, secondhand smoke releases to the environment is much bigger by factor between between 10 and 100 right if you compare already there there it's much less in terms of mass the amount of mass that is released to the environment now there are good papers for example this paper uh, the, this paper has some errors like uh, they really did not uh, I don't, uh, some technical errors but it's more or less a good paper and here you can see black carbon is a generic name for car carbonoid uh, for for particles uh, in uh, made of car carbon like compounds right mm -hmm. they're generically called a uh, black carbon they are identified by certain wavelengths in the instruments that you use to detect them but anyway it's it is a sign of combustion here are the droplets and here are the gas the, the, the gas phase and you can see that cigarette numbers uh, are much bigger than electronic cigarettes like many things are not even detected in electronic cigarettes right there is no detection of of uh, big particles etc you can see no that not detected not detected they also compare with icos icos has more stuff than electronic cigarettes but much less than conventional cigarettes and this is environmental and this uh, in this type of studies you can use humans because uh, you can put somebody, a, a volunteer, sitting down, and uh, you could even check the biomarkers of that person. That has been done as well, right? And uh, what you can see is that the effects of secondhand aerosol are, and this study, um, they really, they they also did because there, it's uh, we need to know the time that you are exposed to not only the amount but we need to know the the evolution in time of this exposure of this form of pollution and also the spatial the spatial uh, distribution right how far it is still detected and for how long time so we, i'll talk about these matters this is another study that only concentrated on the gas phase and um, it was made it's an industry study it's excellent uh, you can see the difference i'm sorry to to bother some people but you know industry most of the industry papers i've read on these issues are better quality than public health people and uh, here you can also see if you compare ad libitum vaping because these are you know using sega likes and so on but this here you have tank models ad libitum you know ad libitum they they were allowed to to vape comfortably for four hours no, no regimented vaping nothing like that they told the vapors sit down be comfortable vape at your will right and uh, they compare that with smokers who were also told you know vape as you uh, smoke as you wish you don't have to smoke 10 cigarettes or 15 no regimented thing if you don't want to smoke for 15 minutes don't smoke smoke at your at your liberty at your will and you can see how the quantities for cigarettes are much higher right much higher so there is evidence of this these are studies so what happens 
it's very interesting to see the difference in the evolution of particle number concentrations. Here in this study, Avino et al., so also a very good study, is among the best in public health people. And uh, these people were, they are chemical engineers and so on, but they work in public health institutions in Italy. So they found uh, when you light a cigarette and then notice how the smoke, how, how the number of particles remains almost constant, decreases very slowly in a time lapse of one hour. See, it's a, a one hour, it is still there. On the other hand, electronic cigarette, first, the quantities are too small, are much smaller. The number, the, the particles. Also, the particles are very different, right? That's another issue because people talk about particles, but not all particles are the same, right? And uh, here you have to look through a microscope to see what happens. And I take it from another study, also very good study made in China by public health people. And you can see the pattern of vaping. Here, the time lapse is in, in terms, it is seconds, it is like five minutes here. Five minutes would be here. And it is like seeing what happens. So as you, re as you exhale, particle numbers go up to much lower levels, but they immediately go back to almost, almost a background level, right? So this is very important because with the secondhand smoke, you are exposed to much more material and for a long time. On the other hand, with secondhand vaping, you are exposed only for a brief period of time because the levels go very fast to the background. And here, there was a bit of a regimented vaping, right? It, this was done by human vapors, right? But these people asked them to, to vape regularly. But vapors don't do that. Like, for example, I can vape three, four, or five uh, consecutive fast puffs. But then I, I don't vape for five minutes, right? It, vaping patterns are not like this. So what, what happens is that when I vape in my home, after one minute, there is no trace of it. We know that because of stealth vaping. Stealth vaping is possible because of the chemistry. And I'll explain that. And, uh, but it's not possible to do stealth smoking. The, the odor, would detect you. And what happens is that the type of particles are very different. In the case of uh, electronic cigarettes, particles are volatile. They evaporate very fast and they're light molecules. They're, what we're talking about, a propylene glycol, a pro, a, a glycerol, and uh, traces, and that's it, and, and water. Everything else is in negligible levels. So they're very, very light molecules and they move very fast and they disperse. What we can say in terms of thermodynamics is that the exhale aerosol is, on, is not in thermal equilibrium with the surrounding air. Therefore, it uh, dilutes to, to the, like the external air acts like a, uh, what is called a thermal bath or a thermal background. It's like if you throw a piece of ice in, the, in a lake, the, the ice will melt immediately, reaching equilibrium with the, with the, uh, with the lake. And here's it's something like that. You vape, it's not in thermal equilibrium, very fast reaches this equilibrium with the surrounding air acting as a thermal bath. And, uh, and that's it. But with smoke, that doesn't happen. Secondhand smoke is in equilibrium with air. Why? The particles are very light and they do not evaporate. They're, they are made of non-volatile, uh, predominantly non-volatile compounds. So they don't evaporate. They, they stay floating. And because they're very small, they can stay for hours. Some of them will hit walls and will deposit because of this property of, of aerosols called adhesion addition, they add, they, they, they glue to, 
to walls or to other surfaces. That's why uh, your clothes smell to smoke. And uh, it's a chemistry. It's a chemistry what explains this, right? Now, we can also see it. we have a very simple chemistry. Here is a distribution of particles in tobacco smoke compared with the, dis with the distribution of vaping. And the time evolution of this distribution, you can see that in the case of smoking, basically the distribution stay the same for a long period. Here, what happens with the electronic cigarette, the distribution flattens very fast. This curve would be here, but it flattens very fast. And levels here are very low compared to levels here, okay? And uh, it's interesting to compare with, uh, with aerosols of cooking, palm, palm oil cooking, olive oil cooking. What you can see is that these distributions, they also change, but they remain for a long time because cooking aerosol is very similar. It has a chemistry that is not so different. It's also a carbon-based chemistry and uh, has, uh, it is mostly fatty acids uh, in, in many organic compounds. It's complex and it's also liquid droplets, but it stays for a long time. This, this and, and also as it ages, chemical composition changes because of other factors like photochemistry and so on. And this is called aging. This aerosols age and aerosol of vapor does not age, simply dies young, as we could say. Okay, so let me talk about, are, are there any questions on these scientific issues? Because I'm, I'm going to enter another segment. Okay, we do have a comment. Um, Adam is like, uh, he'd like to see the scented candles comparison for this. And I'm guessing that this all kind of relates to what they said in that report about, you know, the smoke and the cooking and so on. So could you yeah, yeah. elucidate going, on that? Going, yeah. I'm going to deal with that precisely. Okay. I'm going to use uh, examples of this type to illustrate an example of distorted risk communication in the literature, right? This is based on a talk that I gave. It's an updating of a talk that I gave in 2019 in the Global Forum on Nicotine. Okay, so first let's start that no experimental results in well-designed studies. And the studies have to be well-designed because you have really to take in consideration that any environment that you are sampling will have some some intrinsic pollution of its own, right? You, you are not you are not measuring things in zero pollution. You try to remove as much as you can, ventilate things, but you have to take into account that there is already some intrinsic pollution. Yet, so there has they have never found anything that give reasons to be worried, right? All the studies that are well done. Yet, most of the studies that are made by public health people, not by industry, but by public health people, their conclusions is that uh, environmental electronic cigarette emissions are risky and dangerous. Th this is what they conclude, even though it doesn't, it, it doesn't come from what they actually found. I think they have to say that. Otherwise, they might not get a grant. I don't know. I think there's, it's politics there. Because really, a lot of these studies didn't find anything, but the conclusions are, are really, really worrying. And I'm going to see that. This is distorted risk communication. And I'm going to take an emblematic examples, example, one, but there are many of them. This is a paper by, some, by an Italian team. It's, uh, it's published here, Protano et al., in Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. It's a public health journal. The conclusions of this study are legislative interventions to forbid electronic cigarette usage in public places and indoor environments. They recommend that. They say 
educational interventions to increase awareness on the threats of the use of electronic cigarettes, discourage electronic cigarette home usage to protect children, urgent to promote healthy lifestyles. What we are seeing here is not very different from what happened with secondhand smoke that I already talked about. These people are saying this in the conclusions. The, here is the reference. You can read that paper. Now, what did these authors found that is so worrying? So you say conclusions are horrible. Most uh, the media and the uh, politicians and regulators will not bother. They're not trained to see the experiments. So they will just see the conclusions and, and they will act accordingly and regulate accordingly. But if you're a scientist, you wonder what is these people found? All they did in this paper, and I read it carefully, was to show that recent high-powered electronic cigarettes produce more particles, but they call them particles, we know they're droplets, in the nanometer scale. That's all what they found in this paper. But their message is, beware, is cigarette aerosol droplets are dangerous? Are they really? Let's compare with meat grilling, okay? The same group of authors, the same one, the same group of authors, the same ones, the same, not other authors, the same ones. They looked at household submicron particle in sources, like for example, meat grilling. You can see that meat grilling produces a lot of, partic a lot of particles. And these are, um, you know, they, they age, they are combustion particles. It's a liquid oil droplets. It's a cooking organic aerosol. That's the way it's known and has lots of, uh, for, um, uh, lots of uh, aromatic uh, hydrocarbons, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and the volatile organic compounds. The ones that electronic cigarette doesn't have, right? Only three aldehydes worry. Here you have lots of aldehydes, lots of carbonyls, lots of uh, amines, and lots of other organic compounds in large quantities. So let's compare this with, uh, with the same study that cause, was cause of alarm. The same study that was the cause of alarm with what the same people published with meat grilling. And we see this pattern of a puff going background, going to background levels, a puff going to background levels, this intermittent pattern that goes back to background levels. And this is a time scale that is much shorter. This here, it's uh, 10 minutes and here is 40 minutes. So we would be seeing this pattern here, but at one order of magnitude less, right? If we use the same time, the same time frame, it would be a bunch of zigzags like this. It looks like continuum because their lines are are are, are thick, but uh, rather this is and also it's a regimented vaping, right? They 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 use vapors in this study, but they ask them it was not ad libitum. They they ask them to vape more or less in a regimented way. Right, so you see this pattern, and uh, what happened? The, it only peaks and returns to background values. There's no combustion. The particles are simply made of propylene glycol, glycerin, and um, and humectants, where what uh, vapor, right? Water vapor, right? And so, uh, because most of the aldehydes there are, are the, the smoker already absorbs most of the toxicity. What is released is a minor factor of a minor toxicity. And meat grilling has more, right? So, and the same group of authors, right? Now, they also did it with submicron particles from burning a citronella candle, ask, uh, answering the question. And here is with what happens with citronella. Here, uh, these are particle numbers. 
particle numbers suddenly their background and then as you light the candles it stays it stays because it's combustion emissions are not a, are less than with the cooking but uh, there are five, uh, five to this is like uh, 500,000 particles per cubic centimeter maintain these values as long as the candle is burning right and uh, even when the candle stops burning there is some time when the where it is, where it is still emitting uh, after the candle is burned out and uh, the its combustion particles you have hydrocarbons and uh, polycyclic harmonic uh, hydrocarbons uh, harmonic sorry aromatic and uh, you have uh, volatile organic compounds everything that is in the now let's compare it with vaping the same thing see the same oh, the same uh, measurements that were cause of alarm and you can see the pattern while here it stays for a long time and uh, more or less here the same order of magnitude of number of particles but with vaping you vape and it goes back to the background here it doesn't go back to the background as long as the candle is burning now vacuum cleaners vacuum cleaners uh, the particles are solid it's basically dust where well, vacuum cleaners emit aerosol there is solid particles it's dust and it's so it can be also some uh, asbestos like particles that are not spherical there are more irregular shapes and so on and uh, the gas phase of this aerosol has policy uh, Polyc uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and uh, and it's uh, it can reach uh, it's more or less uh, it's less than than cooking and uh, but it is more it is one order of magnitude more than vaping right okay vaping essentially reaches a high peak which is one order of magnitude less than vacuum cleaning but it goes back it goes back to to background levels and this this particles they stay in the environment look how they stay in the environment okay and uh, so um comparison with cooking aerosol that's also interesting because cooking aerosols let's compare tobacco smoke uh, it remains but it essentially decays by gravitational settling here what happens with cooking aerosols that there is a primary one and then there is a secondary one and it is caused by photochemical aging light it interacts with light and then it changes to its chemical composition right and uh, okay so uh, also in terms of concentration of particles for cooking cheese and bacon eggplants peanut oil and so on it's much higher these numbers are at least one order of magnitude larger than uh, vaping but uh, these things stay in the environment and vaping goes immediately to to background levels right so uh, and it is also some of the authors are the same authors that think that vaping is so horrible you know so we come here to some questions. If the number count and long deposition of submicron particles, we know that they are droplets, but let's call them particles. If you call them particles, then you can identify them with dangerous particles, like particles from air pollution. I haven't talked about that, but particles from air pollution, if you call them particles, then they are the same. Like uh, it's like calling people terrorists everybody that you don't like call them terrorists and uh, so you generate hostility towards these people even if some of them are really not terrorists and this is what is happening here the particles of vaping are harmless droplets really i'm talking about environmental vaping perhaps the part the the droplets that are inhaled they contain some very small quantities of metal and three aldehydes that are very worrying, but they're absorbed. They're not exhaled. 
most of them are absorbed. When they are what is exhaled, it's a very diluted form of something that is already much less toxic than most of these aerosols, right? So if the number count and long deposition of submicron particles make environmental e-cigarette emissions so dangerous, then emissions from candle lighting, vacuum cleaning, 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 meat grilling, you know, they are even more dangerous. Their particles are chemically hazardous. They stay more time. Okay. So if harsh interventions are needed to protect the public and the children from electronic cigarette submicron particles, then we need even harsher interventions to protect the people from candle lighting, vacuum cleaners, and meat grilling. You know, if we're, if we're going to make a, a big fuss about vaping, we should make an even bigger fuss about these things. We should be very worried. People shouldn't vacuum clean. People shouldn't greet meal or, or light candles, right? Is this what the authors are recommending? This would be the logical conclusion. If you follow the science, right? This would be the logical conclusion. Well, no, that's not what the authors are concluding. The recommendations are not alarmist. It's just plain old fashioned common sense, right? What they say is you have to control that such, such emissions you have to control use ventilation, ventilate. You have to improve your domestic appliances. That very old stove, throw it away. Buy yourself a new one. Buy yourself a new vacuum, vacuum cleaner. Dust emissions from vacuum cleaners can be mitigated by improving the filtration efficiency and prevent sub susceptible subpopulations of risks, you know, by by common sense, like if I'm vacuum cleaning, I'm not going to take a toddler and put his head right there. No, I'm going, if I am going to cook, I'm not going to put a, a frail old lady right there and in the stove. I'm not going to do that. You, you would have to be a, a, a psychopath to do that. It's the same thing. If I'm vaping, I'm not going to vape right in the nose of a baby unless I'm a psychopath. And I don't think vapors are psychopaths. So here, plain old fashioned common sense, right? Because you can kill with a car if you are a psychopath, but that doesn't mean that cars should be banned, right? It's just the common sense and obeying the law, right? And so why this plain common sense cannot be applied to electronic cigarettes? Because after all, the droplets are not cause for concern. Why common sense cannot be applied? So here is a gotcha. I think that I think that these people are really following a political agenda. And it's the political agenda that has background and roots where I started talking. There, there are two more segments. Are questions here in this segment? Um, there's no questions, but comments. Yeah. People prefer, va pre people prefer vaping over vacuuming. There's no surprise there. Um, Adam saying his mind is blown away. Um, what is it? And we're talking about, you know, essential oil burners and stuff. I'm thinking here, you know, acceptable risks are those that, you know, provide for convenience. And like you said, it's political. You know, people aren't going to give up grilling meat just simply because it may hurt them, even though the, the grilling meat thing has the additional context of, you know, now they're talking about if you barbecue your meat, you char it, it causes cancer and stuff. But it's all coming down to it's it, it's it's junior high again. Roberta, we're back in junior high. You do what we want you to do in the way we want you to do it. And if you don't, well, then no. Yes. I couldn't hear some of what you said. The sound was interrupted, but. Okay. Uh, what I was saying is, you know, when we're talking about acceptable risks, okay. If it provides a convenience, yes, say, yes. right. And you know, it, 
wait a minute. It's more about the importance of the language and why this is not defined like conflicts of interest. Um, I don't know what you mean by that, Adam. But, you know, it, it does all boil down to, you know, if, if you're doing what we want you to do, or you're doing something that we do and that we enjoy, that's fine. But because we don't understand yeah. it and we don't enjoy it, well, therefore, it must be wrong. And therefore, we're going to tell you, you can't do it. Yes, but uh, here I'm talking about the formation of science. Uh, this, this is another phenomenon. It's a, it's a very interesting issue as well that has been dealt with in other forums. And uh, Clive Bates have uh, spoken very uh, eloquently about this. And these scientists, they, they do that because that's a tendency. And uh, there, this is a global and institutionalized phenomenon, right? And so science uh, is, is, uh, is used to, there's a policy, it's already been decided, right? And it's implemented. Yeah. It's being implemented gradually, and uh, scientists that do not align with that cannot work in public health institutions. Industry is different. Industry scientists, they say the truth here. Here, they, they are accused of being liars and so on, and they were liars 30 years ago, but not now. Now, uh, and the FDA has, has confirmed when they when they revised the ICOS, they they said uh, our results are are are, re are really uh, equivalent to what the industry is claiming, right? Yeah. Uh, can you imagine this conclusion in 1980? That no, in 1990 there was a tobacco war. The tobacco scientists were were the liars. Yeah. And the yeah. other ones were saying the truth. Now it has gone upside down. Yeah. Okay. Let, uh, sorry, another comment? No, nope, we're good. Okay, let's go to the next segment. American and British approach to risk. And this has to do with toxicological markers. Okay, the US approach and on vaping, not on risks in general, but on vaping. The US approach emphasizes risks over benefits. It's an extremely precautionary approach and it leads to a form of distorted risk communication. The British approach to vaping emphasizes benefits over risks. The risks are deemed to be residual in comparison to smoking. That's the emphasis, right? Now, this was uh, examined in a very interesting paper that I recommend people reading, Fairchild, Bayer, and Stabile. The electronic cigarette debates what counts as evidence, American Journal of Public Health. And here you can see it in terms of environmental emissions, the UK finds no evidence that secondhand vaping poses identifiable health risk to bystanders, concludes that harms of nicotine are minor. And here, the National Academy of Sciences, etc., states that e-cigarettes in indoor environments may involuntarily expose non-users to nicotine and particulates. Here, particulates. It's, uh, particulates can be air pollution, can be cooking, can be vacuum cleaning, but the particulates are very different. Here, they're just called terrorists but at lower levels compared with combustibles. They recognize that, but they stay still danger when the Brits say no danger, right? The CDC, uh, e-cigarette aerosol is not harmless. It can contain harmful and potentially harmful substances, including nicotine. Nicotine is perceived as a harmful substance. Surgeon General, calls to prevent involuntary exposure to nicotine. And I agree, the exposure should not be, people that are, don't want to be exposed should not be exposed, right? But nevertheless, we have to distinguish etiquette and, uh, and, not, uh, and this idea of respecting the autonomy of somebody who does not want to be exposed. We have to, risk, to, to separate this concern with actual health concerns, right? Because if it's something very toxic, 
uh, you know, it's very different from some, somebody might object to my perfume or might object to my loud music, right? And you have to respect that. But loud music for, uh, I don't know, loud music for a long time may, it might harm your ears. But light, but, but very hard, high decibel music for five minutes is not going to harm you, not going to kill you, okay? So we have to distinguish all these parameters. And here, for example, in this study by the industry, uh, they compare with occupational safety, uh, occupational safety, uh, the, the threshold of the OSHA, occupational sa safety and health administration. And also with a much more strict threshold because California is more strict, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, California Environment Protection. And you can see that formaldehyde is order of magnitudes less than this occupational one as a general, and it is even below the very strict California one, right? And uh, occupational safety thresholds, you might say they are not sufficiently protective for vulner vulnerable populations, but is, va is vaping aimed for a general population? No, it's not. And occupational thre safety thresholds are appropriate to regulate voluntary exposures for healthy adults in designated indoor spaces. And uh, we know that's vaping. It's, uh, it's not recommended for toddlers, not recommended for all frail people, not recommended for pregnant women in the eighth month. I don't know, unless the woman cannot avoid, cannot stop smoking, but generally it would not be recommended, right? Okay, an illustrative exchange uh, between the U.S. ultra precautionary approach and U.K. pragmatism is uh, Farsalinos uh, made a study about uh, about um, what's the name diacetyl. Diacetyl was uh, you know it was this old legend that vaping produced popcorn lung because of the diacetyl, which is total rubbish because no vapor has ever caught this disease. It's a pulmonary disease, obstructive. And so uh, Par Farsalinos show that uh, quantities of diacetyl are found uh, in uh, like 200, one in 250 with respect to smoking, right? This comparison with respect to smoking that yesterday I showed that it, it misses the information because in, it, it doesn't deal with the mass of the substance in relation with the aerosol mass, but nevertheless, that I was I explained yesterday. I'm not going to talk about that now. But Farsalinos showed that diacetyl and other aldehydes and carbonyls are will are well below the uh, occupational thresholds. Of uh, he used the National Institute of uh, Occupational uh, Safety and Health in New York, and then he was criticized by. Some American colleagues, Hobbes, Cummings, uh, Taylor, uh, uh, you can read the authors here. And he was criticized by using these thresholds because they're not applicable to the general population. They're not sufficiently protective, right? And then Farsalinos replied that, no, no, you are wrong. These are the right ones, the right thresholds that apply to vaping. They need not be applicable to the general population because vaping is not aimed for the general population. It's aimed for adults, preferably smokers, although you cannot prevent adults who have never smoked to try it. You cannot prevent that. But it is not happening. It's, for example, in the UK, what would prevent Joe, Joe Smith in Manchester to, who has never ever in his life touch the cigarette, what would prevent Joe or Jane to go to a vape shop, they are adults, and to start vaping them? Nothing, nothing prevents them. But, but how, many, how many people like that do it? A tiny percentage. I think that is like 2% or maybe even 2% of vapors 
are people who never smoked, two or three percent, and and maybe even one less less than one tenth of a percent of non-smokers suddenly try vaping. It's not happening, but you cannot prevent it. But nevertheless, it's aimed for healthy adults. And when healthy doesn't mean that they have to run marathons, just people that are normally healthy, right? Conclusions in this case, safety thresholds, standard thresholds for occupational safety are not sufficiently protective for vulnerable population, children, pregnant women, elderly, etc. But exposures of other adult, exposures to other adult products of activity would also be deleterious to these individuals, right? In fact, occupational safety thresholds are appropriate to regulate voluntary exposure for healthy adults in designated spaces. They are appropriate, right? Now, in other words, you do not evaluate the safety of whiskey by its effect on toddlers, children, pregnant women, elderly or frail or chronically ill people. I take a chronically ill people and I tell, tell, give him a glass of whiskey, say, drink it. What will happen? That, would, that would, wouldn't be nice, would, would, could harm this person. I wouldn't give it to a toddler, right? But in the case of whiskey, this is understood. Now, why should it be different for vaping? Why? It's ideology. It's pure ideology. It's people uh, saying drinking whiskey is acceptable as long as you are an adult. But vaping is not. I don't like it. I don't like the conduct. That's it. It is ideological. And it started, I already, it started before. It's a continuation of a process. It didn't start yesterday. Okay. Well, the same thing, conclusions. There is no scientific justification to regard environmental e-cigarette emissions as hazardous to bystanders. You know, health professionals communicating risks along an extremely precautionary approach is not based on facts. It is, and they are actually violating the basics of public health ethics. And now sensible regulation will avoid involuntary exposure. People should not be exposed involuntarily to, a, to our vapor. That's absolute fact. I'm not saying regulation shouldn't say vape everywhere you like. No, should be designated spaces. The right analogy is music. If I enter a library with a ghetto blaster, I'm going to be thrown out of the library. If I go into a bus with a ghetto blaster or with a Beethoven symphony, people are going to be angry because you know you are invading their space. But I, as a as somebody who loves Beethoven or symphonies or hard rock or jazz, I I am entitled to have spaces where I can listen to that music. And the same thing applies to vaping. I, a blanket bans are not justified, right? I would say that not even for smoking. But that would be too much for many people. But, and you know, smoking is already lost cause. And we also hope that smoking will be marginalized because smoking is really toxic. But let's put a red line to these people on vaping and tobacco harm reduction. A red line there, no pasaran, okay? To protect these women, uh, pregnant women, a girl does not require to prohibit vaping in, in restaurants or in bars where people know that vaping will be allowed. If they don't like it, they don't go there, right? But if you are a vapor, you know that there are some bars, some pubs where you can go and you can openly throw your clouds, right? And nobody will tell you that you are poisoning anybody. Like nobody, if you drink whiskey, or if you use cannabis uh, or whatever in certain places, uh, people are not going to 
to to look at you as if you were some sort of psychopath. No, you are. It's you are entitled to do that. You are not entitled to force whiskey on people who don't like drinking, on involuntary exposure. And the same principles should apply uh, if you follow science, if you follow ethics of public health. The same thing should apply to vaping. If it is not, then it's because politics and ideology. And I think I, uh, I, can, I can stop here and, uh, and take questions, questions and comments. Hi. Um, do you want me to close your presentation? Uh, no. If, if, there are, if there are questions, I'll be happy okay. to take them. Yeah, the, right. this is all the material. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, what the one question is: Will you make your presentation available? So, can if you want to share your slides with me, and I'll put it up on the um, repository that we're making for the entire live stream because some people were asking for your slides. So that's the first question. Um, the, a lot of the comments that are happening right now, people are talking about flavor bans. I guess in relative to the children, right? And yeah. um, you know, I don't know. Can you see the? You can see the comments on the right hand side, right? Um, let me, let me see. I haven't seen them, but I, I'm sure I can see them on the right um, hand side, the private chat. No comments. Top, top, um, click on the top where it says comments. Um, let's see. I, I can't see it. Let, let me, uh, stop screen, come, come make, stop camera, leave studio. No, no, no. It's on the right-hand side of your screen. You're on the bottom. I'll, I'll just read it to you. Ah, okay. yes, yes, yes. Comments. Yeah. Okay, I, you I, see oh, the yeah, comments yes, are there. I can see okay. That, yeah. um, Leah noted there, and you can see, my whole point with the flavor ban. Oh, no, these flavors encourage underage and those who wouldn't smoke, yet never see them going after alcohol companies about flavors. Yeah, the, the, the issue of flavors is the same. Like, look, there is no scientific reason to forbid flavors. Flavorings, they decompose and they produce uh, some organic compounds that uh, might be safe for ingestion, we don't know, or inhalation, but they, you have to look at the, the concentrations. They're in very small concentrations. And that's the, that's the critical. And, and if you discover some chemical that is problematic, like in the case of the acetyl, well, you just Eliminate that. Eliminate that chemical. And that's it. There's nothing more about flavors. Now, the issue of whether children are attracted to flavors, well, of course, if you take a 14-year-old boy or girl and you tell them, uh, what do you prefer, a vanilla, vanilla ice cream or cheesecake or, uh, I don't know, or uh, anal glands of a... Uh, an animal. Well, of course, they, they, they are humans. They are attracted to nice flavors. All humans are, well, maybe some odd characters are not, but most humans are attracted uh, all ages to nice flavors, right? So to say that uh, you have to remove flavors to make it unattractive to kids would be equivalent to uh, give everybody the anal gland of a wolverine. Yeah. Oh. Right? Uh. What would happen? Well, the children, an old teenager, would say, thanks, but no thanks. But then you are forcing adults to consume the anal glands of a wolverine. Right? I'm yeah. doing an extreme case yeah. because, but in Canada, actually, the restriction they're, they're planning to put on flavors is. Uh, getting close to smoking anal glands of a wolverine, right? Now, um, this is similar to you have a problem in your fingernail and I'm going to cut your arm. Okay, the problem, the problem with the, the fingernail goes away, but so goes away your arm. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attempt to degrade the product it's a product that you hate, that you dislike, and it comes from it comes from a long trajectory that I historically that I describe. These people see vaping as cigarette 2.0, which now has flavors. 
So we want to destroy the new version of the cigar. And uh, we cannot ban it because there are already 10 million users and we don't want black markets. But if we cannot ban it, let's degrade it. And uh, what argument? Oh, the children. Fantastic. Great. Let's do it. That's it. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's a continue. I don't know if you can see that this is a continuation of an institutionalized global politics agenda it's a political agenda uh, it is a global crusade it is something that people who are doing it they believe it they believe in it uh, they believe in they think they're doing they're working for the common good even though there are some casualties but they are, how they are called these casualties uh, um, there is a technical name when when you drop a bomb and some civilians die uh, collateral damage. Yeah, it's collateral damage. Where collateral damage for some global uh, idea that it's uh, some uh, some Jerusalem in a crusade. Yeah, there are collateral damage, but we have to take Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is is this idea of a nicotine-free world, uh, non-smoking, and it is it is they are themselves are evolving, they are upgrading, also. But it's on the same process. And flavor bands is just, uh, it fits very well with this pattern. Yeah. I mean, and that's why they haven't gone after the flavored alcohols either, because adults like them and they like them. So therefore, that's not a problem. Exactly. Alcohol is acceptable. Alcohol is acceptable. Like even Mike Bloomberg, once somebody asked him, what are you going to do when you get old? And he said, well, one day I'll retire and I'll be very happy having a beer in a smoke-free beach. But he will have a beer, right? So uh, I, I think that Michael Bloomberg, who is, you know, it's, uh, it's probably one of the leading actors in this campaign. Uh, he doesn't object in the building where he is that there is a bar that all sort of alcoholic beverages uh, are served and people have their drinks. He might have a drink occasionally. I don't know his personal life. I know that Donald Trump didn't drink. I know that uh, Obama used, was a smoker, a closet smoker. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, drinking is okay. Uh, I think that Matt Myers, uh, another leading actor in this, uh, in this play, in this campaign, in this global crusade, that uh, I think that he doesn't object that people um, drink. And also, cannabis is being accepted now. I, don't, I think that in the uh, uh, Stanton glands, well, he's now retired, but let's say some Stanton glands figure in California, they wouldn't object that people use cannabis, right? Cannabis is okay. Okay, so they don't object that. If you are smoking cannabis in the street, people in San Francisco are not going to are not going to call you names. But if you are smoking a cigarette or you are vaping and, and you throw a cloud, they might be nasty with you. They might slam you, right? So yeah, it's true. Alcohol, caffeine is acceptable. It's acceptable. And cannabis is becoming acceptable too. And in fact, in some extremely anti-smoking areas, like the West Coast of the US, people are also accepting psychedelics and they are accepting other drugs. And they are very humane and very empathic to people that use heroin and opioids. But don't try, don't light up a cigarette in front of them or don't vape in front of them because they crucify you. Yeah, exactly. Um, we don't have any more questions from any, anyone. Um, I think everybody's kind of mind blown, to be honest with you, because this was a mind blowing presentation. Um, Roberto, any final thoughts? Yeah, I think that uh, we have to take very seriously the issue of uh, being able as vapors to not be denormalized like smokers. We have to be very militant in this respect. 
And uh, we have to convince people in our own field. We have to tell them, look, smoking cessation is important, but this issue is also important. And you should not, you should oppose blanket bans on indoor vaping. We, it's a must because what is the use of finally vaping and no smoking, but not being able to do it in a comfortable place that you are talking with your friends and after, after a very healthy meat and very, you, you enjoy the meal and you are very happy and very good company and you have to go outside there is raining because you vape. And not because you drink, you could drink a bottle of vodka there and you can stay there in the company. Perhaps even cannabis. But if you want to vape, then that's it. Then, then you have to go outside. Okay, that's my final thought. We have to have... stop that. Not to be denormalized like smokers. They did it with smokers they shall not do it with us, okay? Last question, I closed your presentation. Last question, if you could talk to the yes. COP delegates, what would you say? Well, the same thing that I said, uh, that, uh, that uh, we are not going to allow to be denormalized. Uh, we, hold on one second because I have. I, I will have to leave very soon because I have an important conversation. Okay. That's fine. okay. Un, un, un momento. Le, le escribo, doctor. Sí, escríbeme. Nos conectamos en un momento. Okay. Yeah, I have to leave because I have okay. a. Okay. That's fine. Important conversation with the people uh, from a deputy in Mexico. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you, Roberto. But anyway, that, that's what I would say. That's what I would say. I would say we are a community. We're not smokers anymore. We demand the right to not to our to, to be accepted socially and to be judged strictly, strictly, strictly uh, uh, by science, by scientific arguments, not by ideology. That's what I would say. And I would I would say that you have to be subject yourself to external scrutiny. It's about time that tobacco control is subjected to the same scrutiny that all science disciplines are. You know, in physics, and this will be my final comment, there was a theory called superstrings. I don't know if you heard about this theory, right? But superstring theory was questioned by many colleagues because uh, you could not prove it false because it had so many parameters that everything could happen. And people were questioned about by other physicists. And, uh, and people who stood by this theory had to defend that theory. They were questioned by external scientists. And we should do that with tobacco control. It's about time that people who work in tobacco control uh, and, and it's important. We need a tobacco control. Within a, we need a WHO, but we have to reform them. They have to be subjected to scrutiny and be accountable. This, this is what I would tell them. You have to be accountable. That's it. It's the end of you judging yourself internally. From now on, I will fight that you are made accountable. That's what I would say. Muchísimas gracias, amigo mío. De nada a sus órdenes. Take care. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye, everybody. Ciao. Ciao.